everyone, welcome to Census Conversations. Census is Scotland's innovation centre for sensing, imaging and Internet of Things technology. And as we all know, the disruption that uh, coronavirus has caused means that we, we can't be meeting so much at the moment in person. Census normally does lots of events throughout the year to gather many different people across industries to network, to share information and move everyone forward. And we normally talk about topics across the themes um, of technology, science, uh, innovation, disruption, and of course, being Scotland's innovation centre. Today, we're going to talk about a very Scottish topic. We're going to be talking about whisky, um, the future of whisky, how technology is impacting the whisky industry, and of course, how technology can help with the, the current coronavirus disruption to the industry as a whole. So with that, let's get on with the show. Hello everyone, welcome to our discussion all about the whisky industry uh, here in Scotland. Before we begin, I thought it'd be great to do some very brief introductions before we dive into the discussion. So me, myself, uh, I'm Jo Milne, I'm a science and technology writer and I cover sort of all areas of science and tech, but predominantly how business, academia and government all intersect. So I'm really excited to be here to be moderating this discussion today. Um, I'm going to go around and just get you guys to really briefly introduce yourself before we get into the discussion. So we're going to start with you, Lindsay. Hello there. I'm uh, Lindsay Lowe, and I'm Deputy Director of Legal Affairs at the Scotch Whiskey Association. Afternoon. I'm Kirsty Wainwright. I'm the Bottle and Operations Manager at Beam Centauri, based in Glasgow. I'm Michael Fletcher. I'm the Business Development Director for Census, which is the Innovation Centre for Sensing, Imaging and Internet of Things. Hi, I'm Murray Blythe, and I work for Siemens. And I work in the Food and Bev Vertical and look after the distilled spirits sector. Thank you, guys. So today we're going to be talking about uh, whiskey, whiskey, that wonderful stuff. Um, but before we kind of get into the future, talking about technologies, we're obviously going to be starting to talk about some of the impacts of COVID. As you can all see, we're, we're doing this remotely, keeping up with it, with the health and safety standards. But before we get into all that stuff, what I thought would be awesome is if we could start with a little bit of a, a view from the bridge. What's happening in the whiskey sector right now? Where are we at? And I'm, I'm going to turn first to Lindsay uh, for that. Well, thank you very much. Scotch whiskey is a global industry based here in Scotland. Uh, it makes up 20% of the UK's food and drink exports. And um, in uh, 2019, exports were worth £4.9 billion. And... Um, we have um, exports to 180 different markets. Um, the industry's positive. It's been growing year on year. Um, obviously, we've had um, a bit of a jolt in uh, 2020 with um, COVID. And I suppose normally, Scotch whisky being a global uh, industry, we've always got some areas of growth, but we pretty much um, everywhere has been on lockdown uh, since uh, for the last few months. But I think the industry is positive. Um, it's going to survive. Um, it's always a long-term industry. Um, the scotch um, being made now won't be drunk for 12, 15 years, sometimes even longer. So there's a, there's a lot of optimism. And I think some of our members at the Scotch Whiskey Association are finding that the hit is less um, extreme than they thought it was going to be. So that that's all good. Thank you for that overview, Lindsay. Really helpful just to kind of get that view from the bridge before we can start diving into some of the tech. Um, I'm next going to turn to Michael. And what I would love from you, Michael, is giving us a little bit of the flavor of some of the, the opportunities and challenges when it comes to innovation in the whiskey industry. And what I'd also like to do is just pause for a second and let's maybe rewind the clock back and pretend I was asking you this question in January, because we are going to go a little bit into COVID, but I'd like to start from that sort of, you know, perspective of what are the opportunities in innovation, uh, forgetting for a moment the fact that we have made a lot of changes over the past couple of months. If you give us that little view, it would be awesome. Sure, sure. Um, I'll broaden it out slightly, though, to food and drink generally, because the challenge is there across the whole food and drink sector. Um, whiskey's probably a bit further forward than, than a lot of the food and drink sector in that it's already capitalising and investing in, in use of technology uh, in different areas. I'm sure uh, Kirsty and Murray will uh, elaborate on that. The reason uh, Census and Scottish Government generally are interested in this sort of area is that in the last five years, 
There's been huge advances in sensing and imaging and internet, which allows people basically to gather information that previously had to be done manually. People have to go out and take a temperature or make a reading or undertake some sort of measurement somewhere in the in the uh, manufacturing operation, feed it back, have a look at it, and then make decisions about how to, to optimise the process. Over the recent times, uh, sensing technology has improved in virtually every, every area. The sensors are more robust, they're more accurate, they're cheaper, they're smaller. Uh, they can operate remotely for, for years on end. The communications technology likewise has improved, and so too has the analysis of information, machine learning, and visualization technology. And all of those things together mean that people can now get information in a real-time or quasi-real-time basis, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, which allows them to make better business-informed decisions in a real-time basis. There's a lot of interest in this sort of area just now. Some companies are already capitalizing on it and they're making a huge step forward. What we're interested in doing is to, to get the message out there. And uh, last year, Kirsty was kind enough to speak at an event uh, where we had a, a range of companies from across the food industry. And one of the most startling things was the interest from all the other food sectors and what was actually happening in the whiskey industry, because they could see that people were already uh, investing where they hadn't. I think you're right in the sense of uh, being able to showcase the potential of technology. A lot of the time is actually just being able to get to grips with what it can do. And then everyone who's an expert in their own field can start to kind of brainstorm and think and make connections and go, well, how is this going to be relevant for us? And of course, today we're focusing on the whiskey industry, but there are so many different elements of this industry as we're going to get into um, that hopefully will be relevant, uh, both in terms of people who are interested in what's going on with whiskey, but uh, sort of and beyond. Um, so speaking of Kirsty, I want to come to you um, next, actually. So as I said, there's lots of different touch points um, and part of the, you know, it's quite a long chain, shall we say, in terms of getting uh, the whiskey from one point all the way through to the consumer. Obviously, you're focused a little bit at the earlier stages um, in terms of the, the production and the bottling um, of whiskey. So I wonder if you could talk us through some of the challenges that you're seeing uh, within the roles that you've had. Uh, both in terms of kind of starting to think about doing things differently, keeping up uh, with what's going on, both in terms of technology as well as the competition within the industry. If you give us a little bit of that overview from, from your perspective. I think for me, and it's interesting what Michael had mentioned there, when I was even asked to speak um, at the census event, I was really surprised because I'm in no way an expert in this at all. And I think that was one of the things that can put people off. So when you're starting to look into it, the possibilities are endless. Um, and I've just been really lucky and the industry is really lucky with all the kind of networking partners that we have um, and it really was just about getting out there getting to see um, having partnerships with you know looking with Siemens and, and Census um, among others um, and the challenge for me um, whiskey is a very traditional industry um, it's that's part of the romance of it it's fantastic and here in Glasgow um, at our Springburn site we do have the kind of traditional uh, we've got cast cash rolling but we also have a very automated uh, bottom line as well and there is room to to improve on that and that's a really exciting opportunity that we have here in Glasgow is automating upskilling but things for me like asset care looking at predictive maintenance looking at our productivity through digital twin these are all the kind of opportunities but as soon as you start to talk about this um people that have worked here for a very long time have got great service great knowledge it can make them a bit nervous um you know that kind of phrase of job replacement can come up so we're very keen to say it's job enhancement um you know we're, we're still wanting to keep that skill and knowledge but we're looking to optimize people's roles um, and a big part of creating leadership for the future um, and teams of the future is about empowerment and autonomy. And for me, all the digital skills and, and assets that we can have is only going to increase that and it's going to drive that. But it's a, doing it softly, softly and learning to kind of sell that vision as a collective. So you're doing the change with the team and not scaring the life out of people and um, introducing all this tech for not explaining the, the purpose behind it. 
Speaking of empowerment then, hopefully uh, this session will provide that for everyone on the call. But I want to dive a little bit deeper into framing some of these these challenges that technology has been able uh, to kind of, shall we say, swoop in and, and help with that enhancement as opposed to replacement. Uh, so Murray, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn to you. I would love to hear a little bit about what are the sort of... Um, I guess, challenges um, and therefore opportunities that the whiskey industry or food and drink more broadly, as of course you, you cover uh, big areas. What is it that automation and tech in general is actually solving? Giving us a little bit, give us a little bit of feel of, of some of the challenges that the whiskey industry is up against. Well, one of the main ones today in the food and drink industry is variability. Uh, and one of the things that we more recently addressed, um, Siemens in collaboration with the whisky industry and the University of Glasgow at the National Manufacturing Institute for Scotland was variability in cask filling because every cask is unique in size uh, and in its charring and, you know, it's it's composite. Each cask is different. Um, and, you know, how you fill that accurately at this moment in time, most is uh, uh, a small automated, it's like filling your car at a petrol pump. Um, and we work, worked on filling, basically totally automating the filling process. So it doesn't matter who operates it, anyone here in this chat, you will always fill to the precise level that you want to fill, whether that be 100% or 99% or whatever. So these these kind of tasks where you have variability either through you know raw materials, the, the materials that you're using in the production, uh, or just human intervention. Uh, different people, some are really good and skilled and others lack that experience and skill. Automation can basically capture your best person and then sustain that output. And that's basically what we try to do with the challenges where uh, maybe areas uh, where automation can can do that, where it doesn't exist or where we have automation. But as we develop that and um, uh, and innovate, uh, with our technologies, we optimize that and become more efficient at doing that task faster, better. How does that help then in terms of coming back to Kirsty's point around not wanting to, pe- to f- people to feel like it's sort of job uh, replacement and rather that it's job enhancement? So if we're talking about, you know, automating the kind of the factory line, is it is opening up time for other tasks for you know people to to take on, or are these tasks that were kind of already sort of semi done by technology but not done so well that were, that are now being enhanced? You know, what's the kind of the, the state of that for you, Murray? We've got a great example in Siemens ourselves because we are a manufacturer and we have a manufacturing facility uh, in the the northwest of England at Congleton. Um, and that has won awards for best in class, world class manufacturing. And all we've done there is adopt Siemens technologies um, um, through modeling. We innovate. Um, and, and basically, as we've developed that and we've automated, we've brought in cobots to work with people. Those, those staff that did those manual tasks now see that as an opportunity to develop themselves and develop more skills and move into other areas. Some of them actually have worked in uh, uh, project development programs where they've actually worked with these cobots and thought about, as Kirsty mentioned earlier, the, the people that have the skill of what it is you're manufacturing, they, they have that knowledge. You want to utilize that knowledge to f- because they come up with the best ideas as to how they could uh, make that task better. You know what the problems were for them. They did what they did and very well. But how could they do? How could they do it better? They would need X, Y, and Z, and that's where you can bring technology in. So they work in these uh, areas, and then if you can can sustain that uh, and continuously use that model to improve, then your business gets better and better. And that's exactly what we do at Congleton. I love that that using the term cobot instead of robot. I've not heard that before. Maybe we should uh, we should be adopting that. <laughs> A collaborative <laughs> robot, yeah. Yeah, well, it's, it's there's all this discussion about you know not not calling robot female names and whatnot. I think cobot should be the next thing that we that we advocate for. And um, Michael, I'd love to stick uh, stick in the sort of manufacturing space for a moment. And as I say, there's many different parts of the chain of, of whiskey and, and food and drink. But let's stick in in the factory. I wonder if you could take us through some of the, I guess, key opportunities that sensors have within that sort of factory setting. What, what can we do? I mean, it seems pretty endless, but I'd love to hear uh, some sort of examples that come to mind for you. Okay. Probably the first one is the one falling on from Kirsty. 
Lucia mentioned uh, predictive maintenance. Um, anybody that's got any sort of machinery that's undertaking any sort of process, if it's got moving parts at all, uh, from time to time, like a car, it'll need to be serviced, maintained, repaired. What you never want to happen is for it to break down while it's actually in operation because the, the costs associated with that are way out of kilter with uh, uh, planned planned maintenance. With uh, sensors, vibration monitoring sensors, temperature sensors, um, even just monitoring the energy of them, you can identify when something's wrong or starting to go wrong before anything actually happens so that you can have a, a, a planned shutdown or a planned replacement, which... Uh, Saves costs, saves time. Um, that's that's one example. Um, anywhere through the process where you're you're looking just to to monitor any aspect of it, uh, whether it's pressure or moisture or temperature or whatever, you can monitor those in a real time basis, um, just to get the the reduce the variability that uh, Murray was mentioning. It's all about. Uh, undertaking the processes in the same high, highly consistent fashion. Um, areas that are emerging, I mean, you were talking about replace, what, what do people do when you, you free up their time? There's more and more environmental challenges, whether that's coming from uh, waste product going out the door or from uh, introducing things like renewable energy into the systems to minimise uh, climate change, reduce carbon usage. People can diversify into, into different areas. Um, I know as well that one of the, the Kirsty mentioned digital twins. So taking real-time information and actually feeding it into the sort of enterprise resource packages so that instead of um, looking at the end of the day or at the end of the week how you've been performing, you can be taking a live feed of data for how many bottles are actually going through your production line um, and getting that information on a real-time basis uh, assist with all sorts of planning, even down to the logistics of when you can then be taking something out the door and sending it off to what, whatever it was, 150, 170 different countries across the globe. So there's there's opportunities at, at virtually every area where people would have been taking or are currently taking measurements or just monitoring or just checking how things are uh, moving along. And that's even down to before you get into the factory, the manufacturing process, right back at the start when you're looking at crops. Uh, there, there's a lot of work now getting into um, monitoring soil moisture, moisture in the soil, monitoring the, the use of any um, fertilizers or, or whatever, just monitoring the health of crops. And it goes the whole way through to the, the delivery of the bottles into the whether they're being delivered at home, like during the the COVID crisis or or whether they've been delivered to a retailer. So there's opportunities the whole way along. I think that that point about opportunities along the whole um, the whole chain, as it were, it comes back to this idea of mindset, doesn't it? Being able to go, okay, this is a technology is this thing that is going to enable me to, you know, as I say, whether it's to do with taking measurements where am I taking measurements across the whole thing? Or where is it that I'm doing a repetitive task? Or, you know, it's it's trying to shift your mind a little bit, isn't it? And so I want to I wanna go back to Kirsty for a second because you obviously brought up the the point around culture change. Um, you know, whiskey is a traditional industry, um, which is part of the the joy of the industry um, and part of the, the lore of the industry. Um, but I wonder if you could maybe talk us through how you have managed to, you know, come into to the, this industry or come into different companies and adopt both yourself, this different kind of mindset, but then, you know, be able to share that with your colleagues and, and lead projects that, that allow for digitization in a way that makes sense in terms of keeping up with tech, but also keeps everyone happy and willing and on board at least as much as possible too. I have an enthusiasm for it myself, which I think helps because um, I think that it's easy to get people on board if you can explain. But I have been lucky that within Scotland and all the network opportunities we have, it's about going out and seeing it. So it's easy to talk about it and it's easy to show someone a PowerPoint, but I have been able to go and demonstrate. Murray mentioned Siemens Congleton. Obviously, um, I haven't been myself, but some of the uh, 
my team in my previous company, uh, they were down and they're wowed by it, you know, because it is, you see all the, the possibilities. And then it's about coming back to our site and managing expectation as well, because you need to think, obviously, investment, um, time. Uh, it can be a bit overwhelming as well because you want to do everything. Um, but it is about sitting to try and make a roadmap um, and we were lucky to work with SMAS on that, um, the Manufacturing 4 roadmap. Um, and they can reach out to places like Census, among others, um, to guide you. Um, but it's really about selling that, I said it before, selling the vision of what is it that needs to happen? Why do we want to change? Um, it's about communicating and talking to people, chatting to hear what the concerns are, because I think... I think it's a great idea, but that doesn't mean to say everyone does. So you just really need to get in, work with project teams, hear all the stakeholder um, feedback. And again, it's just getting that shared consensus of everybody. It's a good idea. Um, this is what we're going to do, but it's just not getting carried away with yourself and wanting to do everything yesterday, um, which I think I've fell down that trap before. So do not do that again. <laughs> It is easy when you see something working so amazingly somewhere else and you're thinking, why can't we just do this now? But it is having that, as you say, managing expectations. And um, and talking also about the um, the positives and framing challenges in particular ways. And, you know, for that, I want to come to you, Lindsay, because I think one of the other really um, interesting areas where sensors and technology in general um, is is really innovating within the, the whiskey industry and is arguably quite an easy problem to vocalize um is around counterfeiting and fraud so i wondered if you could talk us through um a little bit about that what's what's the deal with whiskey fraud and um, and where does tech come in well it happens um like any successful um product um there are those that want to to copy it and i'd say there's probably two broad strands uh we in the scotch whiskey association are tasked with looking after the category so we will be looking for a product um, on sale in a foreign market called Scotch whiskey um, when it's not, and it doesn't copy a particular brand. So we do that for everyone. And then, of course, the second strand is, and, and perhaps the more active one, is members are protecting their own brands from counterfeiting. And I think because we're, because of the nature of the problem, um, we see technology having more immediate application to um, the anti-counterfeiting, the brand counterfeiting. And I think the key for that is quick results. So um, we've seen a lot of technology um, coming in, looking at spectrometers to get the color of the whiskey, um, the, 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 the um, electronic tongue, which got quite a lot of uh, press last year is another idea that's interesting, but Electronic you know, you know, tongue. That's there a was an electronic tongue that could, name. <laughs> um, apparently that could taste the various compounds um, in a spirit and uh, you could program it with a brand uh, profile. So that's something that's being researched. But there already are um, other technologies um, looking at sort of dip tests where people can go into market. Um, we are one of the big handicaps, however, for Scotch whiskey, because it's a geographical indication, it's got a very strict definition and you can't add anything to it. So other products have little traces in it, which you can measure. So you can put a little secret key in it that um, if it's absent, then you know it's fake. We can't do that with Scotch whiskey. So that means we've got to be quite creative. And going back to the Scotch Whiskey Association's work, we're looking at um, products from there are now 130 different distilleries in Scotland. Uh, many, most of the products are blended and, you know, working out whether a product is Scotch whiskey or not comes down to quite a lot of hard graft, you know, maintaining a big database, um, having knowledgeable scientists who know the sort of patterns that appear in whiskey generally. Uh, we're still looking for the magical solution on our side where you can just scan a bottle and find the contents are fake or genuine. Unfortunately, um, I think that's a little bit away yet, but there are a lot of people working on it. And um, yeah, I'm the optimist. 
<laughs> you mentioned there this this idea of being able to and Michael mentioned it earlier this looking at it from the as a whole chain and I wonder where sort of provenance comes in here too particularly to do with, with fraud and counterfeiting too if you can know you know what exactly is happening every moment in the chain so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about provenance then Michael I'd also love for you to chime in with some of the, the up and coming technologies in this space too we really see two very important strands in proving that a product's fake. Uh, to a certain degree, we're looking at chemical analysis. So what is in the liquid? Is it, is it genuine or not? And then also, and, you know, and it still is pretty old school, we're looking at the paper trail. You know, are there the documents? Is this company in China buying 10,000 litres of bulk scotch and producing 100,000 litres of bulk scotch? If that's happening, you know there's something awry. So you've got the two sides. And um, one of the things which has been a major development in the industry is a verification of Scotch whisky. And that's a requirement which is set down by the European Union uh, and which I think is going to be carried forward as we, as we move out of the EU, where um, customs and excise are responsible for assuring that all brands of Scotch whisky are produced in accordance with the definition and they do this by um, checking all facilities that are um, involved in the production. And that starts off with the mashing and the distilling. And it goes right up to bottling, whether that's here in Scotland or, or as in sometimes the case, overseas. And that's still being done on a fairly um, old tech basis. Um, but it has been a huge assistance to us. Uh, it controls the, the product. Um, I think bulk Scotch whiskey is is a, a risk point. Uh, when bulk Scotch whiskey goes somewhere for bottling, that would be the prime opportunity for some sort of fraud. But under the verification scheme, um, bulk Scotch whiskey can only go to a company that is subject to the or a facility that's subject to the HMRC regulation. And I think that's been really helpful in our work. And and you know we've been able to make big inroads. I think probably the question now will be, can we make this, uh, can we build on that? Um, a lot of people have talked about blockchain and whether that has a role to play. Um, I think it's very interesting, but we're still looking for, I think, the killer app, you know, where it can be um, cost effective and, and, and take us to um, somewhere better than we are now. But, but I think that probably will have a role in the future. Blockchain is being used. There are, uh, I think, there's one or two um, distilleries already uh, started to pilot it, and it's really to do away with some of the the need for some of the paper based uh, transaction history because effectively it is a it's a kind of shared ledger of transactions that will give you a history of how the the whiskies come from the the barley the whole way through to uh, the shop, and it should give you a level of confidence when you buy a bottle that this bottle has actually gone through this sort of process. It was started in this field, was distilled here, was produced there, was sent overseas here. Um, and it, it really takes away a, a level of doubt, particularly at the, the very premium end. Um, as time goes by, uh, the costs associated with all these things and acceptance of it will, will come down. But like all technologies in all of these areas, if it's uh, attractive enough, people will find different ways to address them. <clears throat> There's a, a very high level of confidence in blockchain because it's, I think, if a memory serves me, it was derived, developed for things like Bitcoin and electronic currencies. Yes, yeah, secure. So it's, so it's very, very secure. But I'm sure that's been the case with almost any any new technology. There'll be a, a different way uh, that people will address it. But um it, where, where we see technology really helping is it's where people really understand the process. In terms of, uh, we're in a census as an innovation center and we understand the, the, the sort of component technologies. The hard thing is always understanding where it can be applied to give the, the biggest benefit. And what Kirsty was saying earlier about the knowledge that's uh, within the staff, within many of these traditional industries, it's it's utilizing their knowledge to identify where the, the, the key touch points are that you can maximize the benefit from utilizing technology. It's not a case of going in and just saying, here's all these range of technologies, we'll apply them. The, the, 
you, you have to be demonstrating some sort of return on investment. That might be a bottom line cash. It might be uh, meeting a, a legislative requirement with regards to emissions. It might just actually be making the, the workplace a safer place. But you, you have to be identifying what the benefit is that you're going to achieve by applying the technology. Um, we see it in different industries. What we've been doing in the last year, and we've actually started to get a, a lot of traction in the in the, the food sector generally, and also starting into the whiskey sector, is that uh, people are looking more broadly and they're saying, yeah, we can adapt something that's maybe been used in aerospace or something that's been used in a telecoms company to 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 help with profitability. So it's not any specific individual technology. It, it's more where it can have the benefit. Siemens, we do blockchain. Going back to the counterfeiting you know, thing using block using the paper trail and digitizing it right across the supply chain in the industry and taking that digital footprint and putting it on the bottle. And if it's a QR code or whatever that may be, I could pick up a bottle uh, in the supermarket or up the barras uh, or in China and just scan it and straight away get a footprint for from that manufacturer of you know uh, where where the malt came from, you know, where it was made, you know. Whatever is uh, the, the whisk industry deems as a footprint, a fingerprint, if you like, of that blend or that malt, and and to me, you know, the technology exists for us to do that, but it's about looking at the the return on investment, what the cost will be, um, and you know, evaluating that as to find the best solution for, for to fit to to solve that problem. What does it look like um, sort of on the ground in terms of that bit by bit implementation? I think for me, you obviously have to look at what your current state is, um, do a bit of kind of loss and waste analysis on where your kind of key issues are and, and also your key aspirations Um and the roadmap is the most important thing. And that involves employee readiness assessments, you know, um, doing the kind of return on investment um what is the benefit going to be? So there's the benefit analysis. Um, and then it is getting a multifunctional um, team so that it is capturing every single person's input into the change. Uh, for example, we've got a, a really excellent uh, data capture system, a Harford system, which gives us real-time data from our line. A team leader actually just recently said, wouldn't it be good if we could just optimise this and, and make our bottom hole paperless so it was a really simple suggestion um but really effective so that doesn't require a full um assessment of and readiness and things like that that's a kind of just do it but there are larger ones in the background like the digital twin to be used for future apprentices for training so that they can see about changeovers when they're not actually online and all that that for me is, is a bigger program where that's a, a project team um, and doing all the kind of stakeholder analysis, employee analysis, getting their input. And also, we've touched on it before, going out to see what other people do. So in Scotland, there's so many networking opportunities. The industry, whiskey industry in itself, they share. There's no secrets, so we're happy to all share kind of best practice with each other. But it's great to go out to all the other companies and see what they're doing and have take your team out to there and have them chat with the teams that have implemented it and we kind of get the warts and all version of what went wrong, what went well. And if you were to do it again, how would you do it different? So we're really lucky that that's what we get to do and, and get out and capture. And Beam Centauri as a, a global group, they're really good at best practice sharing throughout the sites as well. So it's another advantage we've got when we're doing any of these kind of implementations of technology. And it is, I think it's that just keeping reminding everyone who's watching whatever stage you are, technology can be implemented in small, medium, large ways and you can you can build up. It's not a case of it just being this scary thing that's, uh, that can't be touched or something that, you know, okay, we've done a little bit, we don't need to do any more. There's kind of always always more you can be doing. So as you say, it's about, you know, really looking at where you're at and, and what your problems are. Speaking of speaking of problems or challenges, as we should as we, sh we should say, um, obviously the, the sort of elephant in the room um, at the moment or rather elephant in all our separate rooms because we can't be in the same room to to share our elephant is um is is coronavirus and, and COVID-19 and I want to talk a little bit about um both you know what are the sort of current challenges but also where do you see um technology IoT in particular being able to help you know the sort of back to work 
um, uh, programs and also, you know, help him prevent this sort of thing in the future. Um, Murray, you look like you're impatient to talk, so I'm going to come <laughs> straight to you on that one. You were like, I've got an answer. <laughs> well, yes, I do. <laughs> People from Siemens, including myself, have done some circuits around Industry 4 uh, and digitalization. Uh, and it is a, a, an evolution. It's slowly, slowly, people start to see the advantages of you know more data. We mentioned earlier about measurements that are manually taken, how we'd use sensors to digitally bring that information in. But there's also things that we can measure um, with sensing and imaging technology that maybe we don't just now, but the data is valuable. The current situation, I think, is going to be an accelerator to digitalization in Industry 4. Look at what we're doing right now. You know, normally, we've been in the census offices in Glasgow having this meeting and, and maybe recording it or whatever. It's it's accelerating things. We've, we've seen a massive surge from re- requests for customers um, for uh, our uh, remote connection service. So across the Internet of Things, we are... Um, setting up a, secu- a secure connection for for their staff to access production. Uh, if you look at technologies that are available that we're talking about when implementing, and Kirsty will know this at her place of work today, yeah. uh, and she was when we spoke last week. Um, however, she could operate, she could function in her role and connect to her team and everything um, automatically from home. You know what I mean? She could have everything that she needs uh, at home, she have full visibility in real time of what's going on in her production facility. Uh, and meanwhile, she could be working on her digital twin, trialing out new ideas and things with her team online like this, uh, and then implementing them. Um, so all, all, all the everything exists just now. It's just about how we get there. And I, and I do think the current situation is an accelerator to that. I mean, we've looked at, you know, we are manufacturers as well. Siemens were involved with uh, the, ventil- the UK's ventilator challenge uh, with Airbus, uh, which was a great success. How did we do that? Well, um, we we used simulation modelling. Um, we basically we simulate, and uh, we're doing this for a lot of customers as well. You know, looking at optimise for return. If Kirsty has her digital twin. You know, I mean, she could have utilised that to look at people tracking for social distancing. Uh, she could have real time people tracking uh, solution in place so that she could be warned instantly if there's too many people getting too close to one another. Uh, you can measure people's temperatures if somebody's temperature start to go up. All the all, all these things are, exist but are are coming to light and are, are more prevalent now under the current situation. Yeah, I'm, I'm certainly seeing that, you know, in, in my sort of work as a tech writer, seeing that across all industries, that digitization in general and digital transformation or whatever whatever term we want to use is happening at a staggering rate just out of need. It's not this sort of shiny future th- innovation thing that we're talking about anymore. It's, well, this is what we need for business continuity and to be able to be more resilient um, in future. Kirsty, I want to come to you. I wonder if you could actually just tell us a little bit about, about what it's been like um, at the plant and what you guys are already um implementing or in the in the midst of implementing to make things easier moving forward so we had a, at the very start of lockdown we had an operational pause where we stopped all production um, at this point all the office teams were working from home um, but myself and the team here that's doing production we're on site until lockdown. Uh, we had a two-week operational pause where myself and other uh, managers in the business were actually on site to look at capacity, look at how we can bring the operation back safely because we were always continuing to run whiskey uh, within the whiskey industry in Scotland was was running throughout lockdown as long as it could do so safely. Um, so it's actually, for me, I feel like it's been quite normal because I've always been at work and I've been part of the process of setting up all the, the markers, the temperature check stations that we have here on site. Look, Listening to people has been a massive thing as well because Murray's right, I, I could have been in the house. Um, it was an option that was given to me, but I just didn't think it was, you can't lead a team of people through a, a major challenge um, and not be here uh, to reassure and, and to listen to feedback. So I didn't take that uh, opportunity and I was I was glad to be here uh, so it's been 
obviously volume has been impacted for us because we don't have that capacity. We're running at reduced numbers um, to keep everybody safe. That is the most important thing. So we have to do the social distancing. Um, everything seems really relaxed because although we do, we've turned our dashboards off actually because we do not want um, the driver to be speed. You know, so it's it's more about we're grateful to be getting something produced. So we're not putting that pressure on the teams to say you've got this target, it's got to be out by then. Then it's just that's not what we're looking for. So we actually turned that visual uh, screen off for the teams so that they just feel that they're coming in to safely do a job, and that's the most important thing. Uh, so we've turned that technology off. But apart from that, it's we've been quite lucky because we're not seeing too much of a difference. Although the office is very quiet. And you don't need to book a meeting room because there's no one else to take it. <laughs> so <quite> <laughs> I think that's actually another thing I've been noticing too. It feels like a lot of businesses are going, I don't want to say back to basics, but being reminded of uh, why we even bother with businesses in the first place and why we make stuff in the first place and, and not just trying to optimize for uh, production and profit. Whiskey is obviously a very... Um, well, at least for Scotland, an international uh, industry. Um, obviously, travel is a big part of making sure that Scotland can export. Uh, I wonder if you could talk us through a little bit of that that high level impact of of COVID and how you kind of see technology being able to help uh, get things at least a little bit back towards where they were before, if they aren't already. We're here to talk about innovation and something we're very proud of in the. Um, Scotch whisky industry is um, how we turned our hand to making hand sanitizer. Very quickly, the industry um, set up a portal, um, played its role in dealing with the uh, initial stages of the crisis. Uh, and I think that's a great thing that we're very proud of. So it's been a real eye opener. I mean, we're all today looking at each other in little boxes. And there's, there's two sides to this. I mean, on the one side, Scotch is a social drink. You know, like to drink it with people. Um, it, it brings people together. So um, the sooner that we, we have um, the return of um, the on-trade where, where people get to meet their customers and their contacts, that's great. And we want to work towards that when, as, as it, when it becomes safe to do so. But equally, I think technology has shown that it's got a lot to offer. Um, I think probably I see more people's faces now than I ever did when you were free to get out and about. So, for example, later in the week, we have a working group um, which covers issues in Latin America. And uh, everybody will now be set up to um, join Zoom or, or another application and we'll all see each other. And I, I think that's been really good bringing it together. On the consumer side, um, people have started doing online Scotch whiskey tastings. And um, again, some say, well, it's not as good as the real thing, but it also means that a master blender can sit in their um, place in Scotland and they can speak to an audience all around the world who are drinking the same as them. So I think there's great opportunities there. And I think also um, it's brought into focus e-commerce. Um, the industry has taken um, a big, a temporary hit, but it's partly been made up by the fact that people drinking at home and trading up, you know, they're treating themselves because um, they're not able to go out. And a lot of members, a lot of companies are now thinking about how they can reach people online, can sell more of their products online. Um, that raises technological issues in many countries. It raises legal issues too, uh, which is something that the SWA is working to address. But um, yeah, I think we, we were looking forward to when we can get together and raise a glass with friends. But equally, um, I think it's been, um, it's been a real revelation as to what can be done in your own room. And I'd love, before I finish, I'd just add also the environmental side. Um, you know, we are a two-site office at the Scotch Whiskey Association. We have uh, colleagues in London and our main office in Edinburgh. We also have quite a demanding uh, environmental targets for the uh, the industry. And uh, while it's great to talk about uh, not using so much water or so much peat, we've got to remember how much carbon we use, you know, going to a meeting in London. And I think, again, this ability to see people and uh, communicate with them online has had a rethink and, and, and we'll be learning from that and hopefully reducing our uh, carbon footprint accordingly, even when we're back to normal. 
Yeah, I think the environment, you stole, you stole my next question. The environment one was was where I was going to go to next because I think you're at your spot on. I think um, the, 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 the lockdown and the sort of situation we're in at in the world has really, I think, drawn quite a lot of people's attention if it wasn't already there uh, to the work still needing uh, being done when it comes to environment. Specifically for sensors and for IoT, um, within whiskey or indeed uh, more broadly with food and drink, in terms of how can... Um, sensing technology really impact or enhance um, or give superpowers, whether it's from measuring or insight or whatever, um, for, for companies that are operating a space to ensure that they can reduce their environmental impact moving forward? Two things. One, I'll, I'll jump back to the, the impact of COVID first, because the uh, we've been asked um, to look at helping people go back to work in office or in uh, manufacturing operations in terms of because there's lots of uh, there's lots of press about different sensors that people could use to identify if they're two meters away and whatever um there's also a lot about giving people confidence that they can go back as well uh, a big part's just to do with process and making people feel comfortable about the way in which they they operate in the work environment but we, we've been undertaking some pilot projects with uh, different organizations um, utilizing sensors and small local networks that can identify when how many people are in different rooms so that people don't you don't get too many people going into one room or into a different room, uh, how many are in the corridors, and just using systems of uh, almost like a, a red-green, you can go in, you can't go in. And some of these very straightforward uh, applications can have a, a, a quite a significant impact on um, making people feel more comfortable about uh, when when they're moving back into the office. On the environmental side, um, we've not done much as yet with the the whisky industry as such. What we have done though is work with the likes of uh, SIPA, um, and just now we're undertaking some projects where we're looking at uh, you know, water extraction, uh, which are important both to the, the environmentalists but also to the MD who's actually using water. And it's just to actually monitor how much water is in a river so that you can say, well, look, it's, there's plenty here, take as much as you want or take it however much, or there's not a lot here. So it's just to manage it. Again, it's just all about real-time information to help people. Again, on the, 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 the sort of uh, emission side, um, there are all sorts of sensors that can be used, whether it's for particulate emission or for effluent emission, um, both to identify or quantify what's going out the door, but also to give warning if, you're, if you are discharging, here's some, here's a discharge about to happen. Uh, it can help people um, manage and reduce what, what they're doing. Earlier, you asked about uh, what technologies can actually have an impact. One of the, the big ones that can certainly, I think, can have an impact in this area is uh, the use of machine learning, whereby just monitoring your processes and getting lots of information, you can sometimes get insights that you wouldn't necessarily have come up with yourself in the first instance. And it's the having lo lots of data uh, is useless unless you're turning it into information. And what, what machine learning can help people with is actually get as much information out of the data, uh, information that they don't even see as being there in the first place. And that's one of the areas that I see that um, a big impact coming coming down the line, not just in the, the whiskey and food sectors, but across the piece. Uh, I was over in, uh, the, in Barcelona last year, it seems like a, a long time ago, and there were conferences and people were attending, and it was probably the single biggest uh, message that I took from it was people utilising machine learning, what they call it, at the edge. So that's actually where the sensors are to give back um, added value uh, beyond just measuring a temperature or just measuring a pressure or measuring a vibration um, that can actually help people improve their productivity. 
No, I'm glad. I'm glad you brought up machine learning and, and I guess more broadly AI because that tends to be the the, the kind of technology that both everyone seems to know about, but also it baffles everyone at the same time. And I think just laying laying out exactly as you've done, it's about being able to, I guess. Uh, be empowered by all that um, data capture as opposed to just going and put all these sensors in and we've got all these measurements now what on earth do we do with it? Well, I was just going to say it's very new certainly in our industry I don't know if any applications have been taken on board but the, there's a uh, artificial intelligence um, is embedded in certain controllers that can do things for you um, going back to like condition monitoring for example is as this, is this, is an example of where Sensors have been used um, to analyze um, uh, and, and then predict things that are going to happen with machines. You know, I mean, if you look at a Siemens electric motor today, um, it produces a lot of data because we've we've um, created algorithms around using sensors in the past. Now we we sort of can predict based on the type of use in the atmosphere and temperatures, etc., when when that's going to fail. Um, and you know these. If you connect, if you connect a Siemens electric motor to the Internet of Things or the industrial Internet of Things, if you used uh, something like MindSphere or even even in air control systems, it would it would give you that diagnostic information. Um, so I mean, if you look at it on a much bigger scale, um, things that we have learned, we can embed in controllers um, to to almost give them intelligence. And it's that it's that sort of knowledge and, and 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 that that data that we're capturing and putting into this going forward can be of real value. I always think of um, machine learning and and data capability. It's kind of like being able to see the unseen. It's like giving you another sense, if you will, um, being able to understand through the uses of physical sensors, but also these, um, you know data analysis algorithms and being able to find these patterns as, as Michael said is it's literally giving people who are working and again coming back to not replacement but empowerment um that extra sense um I'm going to go to you Kirsty I'd love to hear a little bit about your your sort of future vision uh, to kind of as we say we start wrapping up this discussion what do, how do you sort of see the the future of the whiskey industry Definitely for, for us at Beam Centauri, as our volume grow, the, the kind of business model's moving a lot towards prestige, as I know a lot of whiskey companies are, are all will be going to. And I guess that's more looking at, obviously, real prestige products that we're lucky to have, but also that customer experience as well, because that is now, particularly with new generations, it's not just about the, the thing, the product, it's about the, that customer experience that comes with it. So from an external point of view, even things like VR for me. So, for example, if you're selling someone a, a cask, a single cask, how do you enhance that experience so much? Um, yes, it can come and see it be bottled, but wouldn't it be great if you could have, you know, some sort of VR cave set up where they can also see the distillery, but then taken into consideration, um, you might not be able to get access over there for COVID or, or some for any reason, um, environmental. Uh, it's just enhancing it so that from a customer experience point of view that prestige product is matched by the prestige experience from an internal point of view I'm really excited for I would like my team to be really known to be development driven project driven and I think all these opportunities that we have it, it's really given us that opportunity to do it and just looking forward to to working with you know the guys in the call and, and all the networks that we have in Scotland and all these projects and sharing how we do them you know, how we do product innovation, process innovation. Um, the opportunity is endless for us. So it's really exciting to look forward to. You're getting me excited even just talking about it. I'm like, look at all these projects, so many opportunities. <laughs> um, Lindsay, let's go to you for your sort of future vision of the of the whiskey industry. Well, um, I hope that Scotch whiskey will, will continue to grow. Um, I'd, love, I'd like to see it um, embedded in the place as the, the world's um, favourite premium drink. Um, I agree with Kirsty that uh, premiumization is key, um, that um, emphasizing quality. And I think that this growth must be balanced with sustainability. I think the industry should be a world leader. Um, we already have a, a, a strong environmental policy. Um, Scotch whiskey is so closely linked to the Scottish environment. It's a natural product. Scotland's reputation is a clean, pure place. 
Um, I think we need to build on that, on everything um, from packaging to the energy we use to how it's transported around the globe. Yeah, I think I think um, those would be the two things, balancing continued growth with um, sustainability. Finally, Michael, uh, obviously you you being from Census, I want to give you the, the last word. What's your sort of uh, your future vision for the for the whiskey industry? I, I, I would support Lindsay's there. It's the it's the uh, continuing to grow, but in line with the sort of sustainable goals and where uh, where technology can really help is it can uh, it can help meet those goals in terms of reducing emissions, keeping the carbon footprint low, making the processes more efficient, um, linking into the whole uh, environmental purity, if you like, of Scotland, um, but at the same time, not diluting in any way the traditional methods of the that that, that are seen as a, a key part of uh, the the whisky. Uh, the drink, it's been the same drink for 100 years or 200 years or, or whatever, um, and it's, it's, it's managing that line. I, I, on a personal level, I just hope they continue to produce very nice products. <laughs> <laughs> I think don't we all um, amazing all of you thank you so much for joining us for this conversation and we've, we've touched on so many different things from various different points in the supply chain through to various different kinds of technologies various different kinds of challenges and of course um, lots on the current the current crisis that we're that we're living through so the final thing just say say a big thank you for for sharing your insights and um, keeping this network going while we're in lockdown and and keeping as as Kirsty said uh, secrets out that are not secrets Secrets so that everyone can uh, can keep learning. So thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. I hope you guys enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. I learned so much um, and I was really pleased to be joined by such a, a brilliant panel of experts across uh, across the food and drink and indeed the whiskey industry. Um, if you've enjoyed what you've heard and you're interested in talking to Census um, about some, some future projects that you might be thinking about or indeed some things you're, you're working on already um, or indeed are just interested in a little bit more about what they do, do go and visit their website. It's census.org.uk. Get in touch, have a chat and hopefully you can move forward your own projects in technology disruption and innovation thank you very much for joining us